Hey everyone, it's Nico here. I wanted to chime in before today's show to say that the episode you're about to hear was recorded on Monday, May 13th. That was just one day before Barry Weiss announced her resignation from her editorship at the New York Times in what was, by all accounts, a a pretty scathing public letter where she claimed that intellectual curiosity, let alone risk-taking, is now a liability at the Times and that self-censorship has become the norm. She writes, why edit something challenging to our readers or write something bold only to go through the numbing process of making it ideologically kosher when we can assure ourselves of job security and clicks by publishing our 4,000th op-ed arguing that Donald Trump is a unique danger to the country and the world. Now, later on that same day that Weiss resigned, New York Magazine columnist Andrew Sullivan announced that he was also leaving his magazine. In his last column on Friday, this past Friday, He, like Barry Weiss, spoke of a growing monoculture within mainstream media that, as he said, is increasingly hostile to individuals whose writing or thinking isn't in lockstep with the prevailing orthodoxy. He wrote that we all live on campus now and that any writer not actively committed to critical theory in questions of race, gender, sexual orientation, and gender identity is seen to be actively physically harming coworkers merely by existing in the same virtual space. So now Andrew is gone. Barry Weiss is gone. It's not clear exactly if Andrew's departure was voluntary or if he was pushed out or fired. Based on the text of his farewell letter, I personally think he was pushed out. But in any case, he's gone. And he's gone because he says the culture at New York Magazine was no longer hospitable to dissenting thinkers. He is now actually returning to his independent blog, The Dish, and is actively seeking subscribers. I wanted to note all of this because in the course of my conversation with today's guest, PEN America CEO Suzanne Nozzle, we discussed this cancel culture debate that is currently raging across America. We discussed the Harper's letter, of course, and we discussed the resignation of James Bennett from his post as editorial page editor at the New York Times, a resignation that came on the heels of the Times publication of an op-ed by United States Senator Tom Cotton, of course, in which Cotton advocated for the use of of the military to stop the violence and looting that was happening across America at the time. This was last month. When it was published, some Times staff members said Cotton's op-ed, which of course reflected an opinion shared by 52% of Americans, they argued that the op-ed made them unsafe. This, of course, also reflects the same language of safety Sullivan said in his New York Magazine piece that colleagues used to protest his writing. It's a language we've long seen deployed on campus to justify censorship. It's, quote, safetyism, as my colleague Pamela Presky calls the phenomenon. We all live on campus now. So this Bennett situation was notable not just for, you know, providing evidence of what Weiss described was happening to the Times in her resignation letter, but also because Weiss was brought in alongside Bennett to make the paper more ideologically diverse after the paper failed to anticipate Donald Trump's election. Now, both Weiss and Bennett are gone, so I think the jury's come in on how well that enterprise went. I also note Sullivan's resignation because Nozzle participated in a debate with him in 2018 that I helped organize at the Comedy Cellar. The debate was over the question of whether there was a campus free speech crisis at the time, a question that is, of course, still hotly debated to this day, Sullivan, along with Jonathan Haidt of New York University, argued that there was a campus free speech crisis. Nozzle argued that there was not one. Notably in that debate, however, Sullivan spent a lot of time also discussing the exact problems at our media institutions that he and Weiss highlighted in their farewell and resignation letters. I'm going to play you a clip from that debate right now. This was, again, from May 2018. This is Andrew Sullivan. I'm, trying, I'm talking about the New York Times, the fact that the op-ed editor of the New York Times can't run things he wants to run with a huge uh, yeah. backlash. And, and it's I'm relevant. Talking about, yeah. I'm talking yeah. about Slack groups in newsrooms and elsewhere in which the pressure being brought upon individual writers is becoming so intense they're in tears or they're, they're having to quit. I'm talking about the chilling measures in which this kind of atmosphere Andrew, is preventing <coughs> younger people yeah, from me, speaking me, me, their minds. That was Andrew Sullivan. You can listen to that full debate in the archives of this podcast, or you can watch it on YouTube, and I'll have a link in the show notes. So, in any case, I think something is going on in our society right now that is quite chilling, that Andrew found quite chilling in 2018, and which is highlighted by Weiss and Sullivan's recent resignations. So, 
I just thought before this episode got underway that I'd note that. Now, let's get on to today's show. Freedom of speech. Fundamental rights. Freedom of uh, conscience. Academic freedom. Freedom of press. And the right to listen. You're listening to So To Speak, the free speech podcast brought to you by FIRE, the foundation for individual rights in education. Okay, welcome back to So To Speak, the free speech podcast, where every other week we take an uncensored look at the world of free expression through personal stories and candid conversations. I am your host, Nico Perino. Before we begin today, I wanted to note that our last episode with Brown University professor Glenn Lowry was was among the most listened to, if not the most listened to episode of the 114 episodes we've released since we began this enterprise, what, four years ago, I think? So I'm, I'm hoping that on this episode, we have some new, hopefully regular listeners tuning in. I don't know what it was about that episode, but uh, maybe it was Glenn's loyal network. He, he's a blogger, as many people know, on Blogging Heads TV. Could have been the topic. It could have been the conversation. I don't know. Whatever it was, we're thankful for the listeners, and we hope you'll stick around. Now, this week, this week we're joined by PEN America CEO Suzanne Nozzle. You last heard her on the show back in 2018, I believe, when we aired that debate, that live debate, over whether there was a campus free speech crisis. She was one of the debaters on the no, there isn't side. Now, Suzanne is back, and she has a new book due out next week titled Dare to Speak, Defending Free Speech for All. Suzanne, welcome back onto the show. It's it's kind of weird reminiscing on live events because I have no idea when we'll be able to have those again. Very true, but nice to be here nonetheless. Let's pick up kind of where that debate left off. There's a portion of your book titled The Skeptical Generation where you relay some of the survey data from, I think you, you cite Smith College and some Pew polls that suggest members of the so-called Gen Z uh, who were born, believe, between 1995 and 2010, and even some millennials show wider support for censorship compared to previous generations, for example, Gen X. Whether that data indicates a crisis, I don't know, but I wanted to ask kind of how do you, how do you think about that data? Yeah, I mean, look, the data sort of points in different directions. Most even young people will say that they firmly support free speech. And if there are concerns about free speech, for example, on their campus, that they think that's a negative thing. But then when you drill down a level and ask them about, for example, whether they would support prohibitions on hateful speech, increasing numbers say they would be open to that or amenable to that. And I think what that reflects is this concern, particularly over the last few years, that hateful speech has sort of run amok in society. It's been kind of emboldened and legitimized by people at high levels of government and the president, and that, you know, this rising generation that is deeply concerned with issues of inequality, racism, justice, believes that something has to be done, that the problem of hateful speech and the way that it affects people is not something we can turn our backs on, that there needs to be a solution. And they sort of, I think, are at a a bit of a loss as to what that solution can be short of bans, prohibitions, and punishments. So that's why I think we see them sort of holding these two things in their head, both that they you know, believe in free speech, but that they think something must be done about hateful speech, even if that means uh, empowering authorities, be it government or an institution like a private university, to clamp down on it. But is that is that new? I mean, when you look at the data, we've seen for decades, general support for free speech principles. But I remember speaking with Arye Nair, the Open Society Foundation, about the Skokie case. And he was on a, I think it was a radio show or a television show that allowed allowed him to get live feedback from the audience. And they asked, you know, the audience, do you support free speech? And of course, you know, you get, you get the, the overwhelming support for it. But then they asked, you know, would you support neo-Nazis protesting in front of the city hall? And that support plummeted. So do you think it it is new and, and or or is it just something particular to this generation? I mean conflicts between racial justice, social justice and and free speech have have existed throughout America's history. Right. I mean it goes back to the the title of Nat Hentoff's old book Free Speech for Me and Not for Thee. You know, this notion I talk about in the book of 
hypocrisy uh, concerning freedom of speech and that, you know, people feel much more of a sense of urgency in defending the speech of those they agree with than they do when it comes to speech that they find, you know, abhorrent or uh, menacing in some way. And so, you know, that's that was true back in Skokie days. and It's true today. I don't think it's a new phenomenon. But I think what is new is this sense of urgency that a rising generation has about what it's going to take to bring about a more equal, inclusive, and just society, and that the marginalization, discrimination, bias, structural racism you know, has to be rooted out, that we've let this fester for too long, that it's too pervasive, that we've turned our back. And so something must be done. And I think that's where you have this sense of urgency around the problem of hateful speech and the idea that there need to be remedies and that, you know, even if those remedies may result in curtailments of freedom of speech, that, you know, that may be worth it for the aim of bringing about a more just society. So I think, you know, that's kind of what's changed. It's become a more salient and pressing issue in the minds of this generation. You know, and I think for for justifiable reasons, I think their underlying concerns are very legitimate ones. And you know, that what they're pressing for is correct, that we do have unfinished business in this country in terms of rectifying our legacy of racism. You know, my belief is that we can do that without curbing robust protections for free speech, but it's going to take work. And I think, you know, young people are right to point that out. At the at nearer the end of the book, before you get into the social media portion of your book, you talk about uh, formal equality versus substantive quality. Formal equality being kind of what the frame, legal framework behind the First Amendment has been throughout our history. The belief that to achieve fairness, people must be treated the same way at all times, regardless of individual backgrounds or circumstances. I'm quoting from your book here. That's a viewpoint neutrality uh, principle. But the substantive equality idea is the belief that because individual situations can differ vastly, in order to achieve equal opportunities or results, it may be necessary to adjust for those differences and, in some cases, treat people distinctly in order to foster greater equality as an outcome. Do you see students pushing for more substantive equality? You know, I do. I think there's a recognition that, you know, it wasn't enough to eradicate kind of the most overt forms of exclusion on the basis of race or religion or gender from, for example, universities or workplaces that, you know, that was one level. And some people, you know, had new opportunities as a result of eradicating those forms of discrimination and bias, but that the institutions, you know, nonetheless, you know, many decades on, uh, remain slanted in terms of who they serve, who benefits, who rises to leadership. You know, we're now, uh, you know, 60 plus years after Brown versus Board of Education and our, our schools across the country are still profoundly segregated. So I think people are taking a look at these, you know, more persistent, insidious forms of bias and discrimination that are, you know, can't be rooted out simply by a decision in a courtroom or a formal policy that gets adopted and require kind of a much more searching society-wide effort to get at the roots of discrimination and inequity and historic uh, denials of opportunity. And so I do think they take a kind of more comprehensive approach to what it will take to you know, finally eradicate the scourge of racism and that it does kind of go beyond instituting these formal protections. So what does that mean for free speech then? I mean, what does a substantive equality framework look like if implemented uh, under the First Amendment? You cite one su- Supreme Court case from 1952, and I'll probably butcher the pronunciation of uh, the petitioners in this, but uh, Baharness versus Illinois dealing with group defamation? Yeah, Boharnay, yes. Yeah, you Boharnay. Know, there we there go. Have French been, word. <laughs> it's interesting. I mean, there have been theories advanced over time about how the First Amendment could be applied to go further toward the realization of substantive equality. And that's one of them. And it involves the idea of group defamation, that denigrating not just an individual, but a group could be considered you know, equivalent to libel. You could have a cause of, a group could have a cause of action the way an individual would if their reputation had been harmed. And, you know, that has not been the prevailing view. And, you know, what I would say in terms of the realization of substantive equality from a free speech perspective really has less to do 
with reinterpretations of the First Amendment and more to do with what we achieve as a society in terms of realizing free speech for all. I mean, there's a reason why the book is called Dare to Speak, Defending Free Speech for All. And that for all piece of it, you know, to me is extremely important. And it means looking at what are the structural barriers to full participation in public discourse. I talk in the book about the situation, for example, in newsrooms where targets for achieving racial equality and racial representation among journalists and newsrooms have been systemically uh, missed. And you know, they're kind of 25 years behind in reaching their goals in terms of more diverse and racially representative newsrooms. There are similar lags in book publishing, where the staffs of major publishing houses remain overwhelmingly right. And there are a number of reasons for that. And, you know, the numbers of books published by authors of color lag far behind. And, you know, you could go industry by creative industry, by creative industry, whether it's magazine publishing or Hollywood, and you see this, these systemic patterns of underrepresentation where the stories that are told are reflections of who dominates in society. So I believe in order to realize free expression, you have to tackle those barricades as well and help to lower the barriers, help to catalyze the careers and the opportunities of people from communities that have historically been excluded. And that when you do so, that's a boon for free speech. That's an opening up of our discourse. That's a widening of the range of ideas that are available for all of us to consider. And if you think about, you know, what are the underlying reasons why we protect free speech in the first place. It's really because of this faith in the broadest possible marketplace of ideas. So if you have people who are cut out of that systematically, uh, you know, whether it's by reason of government in impairments on their rights or it's because of socioeconomic factors, they don't get the education, they don't have the resources, they don't have the opportunities, the platforms, the roots to be published, you know, those barriers count as well. And I think a comprehensive approach to free speech has to tackle them. Well, then what do you make of uh, sort of ideological diversity and the considerations of organizations like Heterodox Academy within the academy when you look at a situation on campus where, for example, a Turning Point USA group uh, can't be, uh, can't get recognition because they can't find a faculty advisor because at places like Harvard, you only have 1% of the faculty that's conservative. Uh, and then as far as representation of different political uh, viewpoints, even within our news institutions, I mean, we saw what happened with James Bennett at the New York Times for publishing a, uh, a, an op-ed from a, a sitting United States senator. So how, how, do, how do those factors into in the consideration about raising up different voices? I think ideological diversity is extremely important and there's enormous pressure in that area. And, you know, I am concerned about a kind of constriction of our discourse, particularly right now, as we embrace and move toward new ideas that there can be a, a sort of absolutism in the way that that is done that makes people feel you know, genuinely leery of expressing even just questions, uh, you know, much less sort of dissenting opinions or even real resistance, but, you know, simply casting doubt on some of the precepts of, you know, the movement now afoot for racial equity can, you know, put you in a difficult position. You know, if you're asking questions about what is the best approach to policing reform, that can be seen as a betrayal of the goals of Black Lives Matter. And I, I you know, I don't think it should be that way. I think that's worrisome in terms of, again, this question of the breadth of our discourse and the range of ideas that we're willing to entertain. And on campus, you know, I think you're right. There are a limited number of conservative voices that, you know, they're influential on some campuses and very much marginalized on others. And in the course of PEN America's work on campus free speech, we've also seen, you know, how that can trigger a real backlash. I mean, at the University of California, Berkeley, when we went there a few years ago to talk about all the events that had erupted in connection with the visit of Milo Yiannopoulos, and we had kids from the college Republicans who were there, we sort of said, you know, what led you to issue this invitation to him in the first place? And it you know, was driven by, they said, this sense that on that campus, a very left-leaning campus, this, that the space for them to operate was very small. Like you said, they couldn't get faculty advisors without a faculty advisor or a departmental sponsor. You couldn't book a room for an event. And they felt 
sort of boxed into a, a corner there. And even some of the students of color and progressive students acknowledged in this conversation that for college Republicans at UC Berkeley, you know, it, it could be a, a steep pill to climb. And, you know, that bred a sort of resentment that led them, I think, or played a role in their decision to invite Milo Yiannopoulos and simply, you know, prove the point that they could do so. And, you know, that, of course, you know, ended up in huge expenditures and a lot of negative publicity for the college Republicans and the university as a whole, and was very divisive and polarizing. So I think it's extremely important for universities to make space for ideological diversity and to try to facilitate reasoned discussion on even controversial, fraught, and sensitive questions, you know, where you know you can easily descend into accusations that somebody is being undermined or their identity is being called into question and to sort of model the ways in which those hot button issues can be discussed respectfully, civilly, and that you know the difficult conversation can go forward even despite the hurdles and the risks of misinterpretation. Well, I have to ask you because PEN America defends the right of writers and, and artists, uh, their right to free expression. I have to ask about this, this Harper's letter, which has become quite the topic of conversation uh, within writers and journalist circles on Twitter, for example, uh, 150 people signed it, uh, many of whom I suspect are probably members of PEN America, uh, including Salman Rushdie. What do you make of this cancel culture conversation? I mean, in the letter, they say the free exchange of information and ideas, the lifeblood of a liberal society is daily becoming more constricted. Editors are fired for running controversial pieces. Books are withdrawn for alleged inauthenticity. Journalists are barred from writing on certain topics. Professors are investigated for quoting works of literature in class. A researcher is fired for circulating peer-reviewed academic study, and the heads of organizations are ousted for what are sometimes just clumsy mistakes. You know, I can't speak to all these uh, generalizations. I can speak to professors, for example. I mean, in, in June, FIRE received something like 300 case submissions. Uh, to put that in context, we receive about 1,000 a year the past couple of years. So in one month, we received almost a third of the case submissions we got. And they often involved faculty members or students speaking out against the recent protests or um, asking questions about the recent protests. I mean, at, at UCF, University of Central Florida, uh, there was a professor who was investigated for claiming that there is such thing as black privilege. Uh, we have a professor in California who was quoting from Martin Luther King's letter from a Birmingham jail, in which uh, Martin Luther King uses the N-word twice. He's investigated for it. And the problem with a lot of these cases is most of them involve students who are under or professors who are under intense pressure and they don't want to go public with it either. And one of the criticisms I've been seeing of the Harper's letter is that it speaks in broad generalizations. And then you see uh, people dismissing it as a result of that. But if our experience on campus is any indication, a lot of these people are afraid of going public precisely for the reasons that cancel culture uh, is a concern. So what has your experience been in the in the literary world? Books being withdrawn uh, for alleged inauthenticity, journalists barred from writing on certain topics. I mean, we saw what happened with James Bennett at the New York Times, um, you know, quoting lax, uh, works of literature, et cetera. Yeah. Look, I one of the reasons I wrote the book and centered it around these 20 distinct principles that, in my mind, sort of provide a pathway to living together in our diverse, digitized, and divided society without resort to curbs on free speech, is that I think to talk about these issues, you kind of have to say a whole series of things in order for people to really hear you out. And, you know, I have chapters in the book talking about the importance of being conscientious with language and being aware, for example, if your students are going to be highly sensitive about hearing the N-word in class, that's something I kind of think at this point professors should be cognizant of. There have been many incidents over the last few years, as I know you know, of professors who use the N-word in a pedagogical sense, and they absolutely are not using it as a slur. They don't intend to offend anybody. They're gobsmacked when there's a, a strong, harsh reaction from students. But I think when that sort of happens enough times as a professor, it's sort of incumbent on you to be 
aware enough of the mores of a rising generation and the students who sit in front of you in class that if you're going to do that, you're at least going to say something in advance or explain why you're doing it or position it so that it doesn't elicit that reaction. So that's sort of my point in the book about conscientiousness. And I think that's key. I also have a point in the book about the harms of speech and how important it is to acknowledge those fully and not be seen to dismiss or downplay them, as I think some advocates of free speech from time to time do, you know, out of a, a genuine concern that if you kind of cop to the harms that, you know, that's a slippery slope toward legitimizing restrictions on speech. But, you know, I think it actually works the opposite way, that by fully taking on board the harms that speech can cause, you strengthen the defense of free speech because you recognize that, you know, there are hurts and there are forms of damage that can result from speech and that those are things that need to be addressed and remedied and mitigated if free speech protections are to persist. So I think in the context of the Harper's letter, many people interpreted it as sort of waving away those considerations, the obligation of people with powerful platforms to speak conscientiously, the fact that speech can bring about genuine harm in certain instances. And they, you know, even though the letter had some gestures toward that, those points, I think the thrust of it was about this kind of informal censoriousness and mob mentality that can arise in response to speech and the chilling effect that that has. And so I think it's illustrative of why it's hard to talk about this and that you kind of have to say all these things in the same breath as, you know, in a sense, I tried to in the book, um, you know, if you could call that one big, big huge breadth, uh, you know, across 300 pages. But there's a kind of a lot that you need to say in order for uh, the, the defense of free speech to speak to the concerns of a rising generation and be reconciled with the drive toward more inclusivity and equality. I think the case can be made. And I think the case for free speech is strengthened when you put it in this context. But, you know, I think what we saw in this instance was, uh, you know, that only one part of the message really kind of came across. And there was a sense that these other elements, and, you know, also the piece we talked about a few minutes ago about the voices that are excluded. You know, many people criticize the letter sort of saying the larger problem is that uh, there are whole communities of people that have been systemically denied the opportunity to engage in free speech or have powerful platforms for expression. And that's a much more serious and weighty impairment of free speech than the sort of cancellations that you're talking about. And so I think that at the core of the letter is a very legitimate issue, but I think to get that across, you sort of have to make these other really critical points about what it will take to realize free speech in this country. Yeah, the other piece is, of course, the whole debate over the signatories. I thought that was really unfortunate, the idea that individuals were tarnished by having put their names on a letter with certain other individuals who, you know, people staunchly disagree with or, you know, believe are fundamentally wrong or offensive uh, in certain aspects of their opinions. You know, that I think it's fine. You know, if you don't, uh, if you believe J.K. Rowling is transphobic and uh, that her views are unsubstantiated and bigoted, I think that's fine. But to sort of tarnish everybody else who signed the letter because her name was on there, I think is a sort of guilt by association and a, you know, a sort of lowest common denominator notion. I think what these people were sort of trying to do is say that, you know, across a pretty wide range of backgrounds, professions, ideologies, and orientations, you know, there's some element of common ground. And I, I think we need more of that common ground rather than less. So I would encourage people to sort of reach out to strange bedfellows and to avoid judging one another, you know, based on, you know, that pretty thin association. It was also clear these people had not reviewed a list of signatories ahead of time. They weren't endorsing all the others on the list. Uh, so I thought that was an unfortunate element. To your point about people's experiences, subjective experiences, I mean, this is one of the points that, that you make in criticizing uh, my boss, Greg Lukianoff and Jonathan Haidt's book is that 
uh, you feel as though free speech advocates can be too sweeping and dismissing subjective perspectives. Uh, you write, in a diverse society, varied backgrounds and identities shape how events and speech are experienced. For a society to treat all people equally, it must be willing to consider these divergences. Now, I don't want to speak to Greg's book and uh, Greg and John's book because I didn't write it and it's, uh, and I don't know all the stuff about mental health that, that they discuss in the book. But this, this question of accepting uh, subjective perspectives or experiences kind of like almost as a prerequisite to making the free speech argument that might not be quite what you're saying but you know you hear on campus that people say for example Ronald Sullivan at Harvard makes them feel unsafe because he def- he's a, a defense attorney for Harvey Weinstein or you you hear people say that Nicholas Christakis at Yale makes them feel unsafe i think that's uh, exactly what that one woman in the video was saying you hear at Brown University um, people trying to get Guy Benson, a conservative commentator, uh, prevented from coming to speak on that campus. They say because he supports fiscal conservatism and free market ideology, he's enabling white supremacy and fascist ideas. You know, I just don't accept those premises. So I, you know, I don't know what the next logical step is. You know, I accept that they actually feel that, perhaps, and that there's there's emotionality behind it. But I don't know. I don't think they're right. Like I don't think someone at Harvard is less safe because Ronald Sullivan is um, the the living faculty member in the dorm room. But maybe that's me just being callous. And I think what Greg and and Jonathan were asking people to do is is by to to kind of analyze their thoughts uh, in the way that cognitive behavioral therapy taught Greg to when he was going through a suicidal depression and trying to understand whether those thoughts are grounded in reality or whether they um, are, you know, a form of catastrophizing, for example. Uh, But in these cases, we're talking about, you know, accepting these thoughts and perhaps the next logical step is, or one of the demands being censorship. So I I wanted to get your take on that. Like how, how how do we empathize without censoring? Yeah, no, it's a great question. I think Jonathan and Greg have done extremely important work in, bringing to the foreground of the discourse, the idea that these harms, and you've given some good examples, can easily be and often are exaggerated, overstated, that there's a mentality that takes hold where people uh, experience harm or feelings of being unsafe, you know, in response to stimuli that in generations past would not have elicited that reaction and that we do want to inspire introspection and efforts to equip people to deal more readily with the whole range of challenging ideas and opinions and things they disagree with and that may be a little bit unsettling or upsetting without arriving at this point where they feel so deeply undermined that you know, they turn their back, walk out of class, uh, and become completely alienated and, and have a sense of almost victimization as a result of, you know, something that may be going on in the classroom that, you know, a decade ago wouldn't have elicited a reaction or anything like that. You know, the, the thing, though, I do think is that you've given many examples, and I talk about uh, a number of them in the book, the Christakis's at Yale and Ronald Sullivan at Harvard, in which in both instances, I think, you know, the net result was a kind of punishment for expression that was totally unwarranted. And it was a sort of reification of these very subjective feelings that, you know, if you dug a little deeper, I think the students could have brought been brought around to understanding, you know, where the faculty member was coming from and why their actions, for example, Sullivan's role in the Weinstein case, you know, should in no way make people feel unsafe with him uh, being uh, involved in a residential house. And I, I felt both universities kind of stopped short of facilitating that kind of searching dialogue so that people could reach common ground. You know, that said, I do think, and I say in the book, that there are examples of speech that are genuinely menacing uh, and harmful. And, you know, it can be nooses hung in trees, you know, American University, the days after the first, the university's first African-American student body president was elected or persistent 
microaggressions where people are hearing denigrating messages their whole lives, questioning, you know, whether they belong in an academic environment or the, the, the news question, the news example is actually a good one because you had that situation at, I believe, American University, which was what's horrible. But you also had a situation at Duke where a, uh, uh, a student, I believe, from China hung a noose in a tree and took a picture of it and said, hey, come, uh, texted essentially his friends, come hang with me, not understanding the uh, cultural context in America that comes along with doing something like that. But the noose was found devoid of that context, and people were gen- genuinely concerned that there was some sort of racist uh, incident happening on campus. But it took that additional step to actually investigating it um, to to realize that the, the racial animus wasn't there from the beginning. You, you kind of also saw that with the NASCAR example these past couple of weeks. So, you know, it, it does, you know, people can sub, uh, subjectively be fearful of these things, and, and perhaps that's the right initial reaction, but it doesn't mean we shouldn't investigate it. Absolutely. I mean, I have a whole chapter on intent and context, and I think this is one of the most important elements of the equation is that no matter how clear it may seem on the surface that, you know, there is uh, something racially or gender wise offensive that's being communicated. It may not be the case. I mean, I use the example of the math teacher at Friends Seminary who, you know, put his arm up at an angle and said, Heil Hitler, you know, and sort of what could be a more obviously anti-Semitic uh, commentary in the classroom than that. But, you know, in fact, when they investigated, you know, this is a guy who was like, the grandson of, sorry, the son of Holocaust survivors. And you know, it was just a, a momentary kind of uh, off the cuff statement that came to his mind that had zero anti Semitic animus, and the students were completely behind him. And, you know, in the end, he was reinstated. And it was just a vivid example of something that on its surface, I mean, uh, you know, the Bubba Wallace thing as well. You know, if it looks like a noose and this is the only African American. Uh, in in NASCAR, it seems pretty obvious what's going on, but sometimes that can be wrong. And I, so I think you know those examples are important, but they shouldn't detract from the fact that they're also examples. For example, American University, where someone actually is hanging a noose in order to intimidate a student leader. And so, you know, I wouldn't be quite so quick to point out the counter examples. I think you have to you know dwell longer on speech that is genuinely intended to intimidate, to belittle, to demean, because it's real. It happens. It has a drastic effect on people. It uh, impairs progress. It reinforces historic feelings of marginalization and exclusion. And as free speech defenders, I think we need to acknowledge that and we need to fight against it. We need to condemn hateful speech. And, you know, there's no contradiction between doing that and defending free speech, you can reject someone's message adamantly while still defending their right to express it. And I think it's particularly important if we want our message to be heard that communities that have been historically excluded hear from free speech defenders that we recognize and care deeply about speech that can cause harm. Well, let me let me ask you this because I think we at Fire take a, a slightly different approach. Not that we as individuals don't agree with all those uh, concerns, and I, I'd say many, if not most, of Fire uh, Fire staffers do. But at, insofar as our mission's concerned, we always try and maintain viewpoint n- neutrality on the content of speech. The idea being that if we condemn this speaker and not this speaker, certain speakers might be less likely to come to us for help uh, in the future, either uh, through, uh, you know, seeking legal help or, or public advocacy help. And then you also, we're also concerned about the position that you might get in where you, um, you know, are called to give an opinion on this or that, you know, uh, we work with groups, you know, that are supportive of Israel. We also work for Students for Justice in Palestine. Some of the students that are supportive of Israel might say that the activism of the Students for Justice in Palestine makes the campus unsafe for them. I believe some have actually said that. So then you get into the position of having to judge harms, which as a civil liberties organization is, a, we think is kind of a slippery slope. So we just play it down the middle determining whether it's protected or not in the course of our doing work. But PEN America takes a little bit of a different approach, I mean, as it kind of has come through in this conversation, right? 
think somewhat different. I think each organization has its role to play. And I think fire has a very important role to play in that viewpoint neutrality for you, I think is central to your mission. And it is why professors uh, and faculty members left and right can turn to you. And, you know, we tell them to turn to you if they've been <laughs> retaliated against, you know, uh, that you, you should be the first place really that they should call. So I, I, you know, I, I don't think we all need to play the same role in this. But when you look at, for example, the role of a university administration, if there is hateful speech on campus, I think they ha- do have a dual role to play, both in supporting students who, you know, feel they feel legitimately victimized by something that, you know, clearly goes into the territory of bigotry, even if they're defending the speech as uh, within the permissible bounds of the First Amendment. So I think that dual role, uh, in some instances, particularly when it's an authority that people are looking to for, you know, sort of a, a guidepost, is this kind of expression tolerated or suborned on this campus? You know, am I in a place where biased attitudes are allowed to run rampant and there's no real counterweight? I think, you know, that's, that's a situation for minority students that's untenable and they need to feel they have the support of the administration and administrations we have seen in recent years, I think doing a better job of being able to kind of communicate these dual messages that, you know, what was said goes against the values of the university, you know, and yet it constitutes protected speech. And there are gray areas, you know, you know, sort of you touched on some where people would characterize, you know, any defense of capitalism as white supremacy. You know, do we expect the university to come out against that? I don't think so. And I think we have to be vigilant. And I know uh, you do this in terms of, you know, where re- reaction is legitimate and there's a basis for it and where we believe it's it's spurious or it's overblown uh, and it needs to be countered through reason dialogue. So I don't think you can lump it all in one category or the other. You know, that's the thing about these, you know, each of these incidents is, is, is fact specific. That's why intent and context matter so much. Yeah. Well, the last podcast, the one that got a surprising number of listens was with Professor Glenn Lowry of Brown University. And I invited him on to talk about uh, academic freedom in particular, because uh, Brown's president, Christina Paxson, had just written a letter kind of showing solidarity on behalf of the administration, uh, showing solidarity with Black Lives Matter and its and its critiques of structural racism. And Glenn Lowry, uh, who uh, you may or may not be familiar with, he's a, pro- he's a professor there, he's a black professor there, um, objected to the letter because he thought that it was the administration taking a position on contentious current events. Uh, and as a result, chilling dissent uh, on those vents. And, you know, it can be a slippery slope, but if you look to the University of Chicago model uh, and the, the Kelvin statement from the middle part of the century when the university was trying to be pulled in, I believe it was in the 50s or 60s, uh, during all the debates around uh, communism and the Vietnam War and whatnot, and the, the university just decided to say at that point, we're viewpoint neutral on uh, modern social and political questions. Uh, And I invited Glenn to kind of talk about how universities are moving away from that to take positions on certain certain, uh, hot button topics, like Black Lives Matter, for example, and what that might do to to academic freedom. Do you see there as being a sort of chilling effect, uh, effect, or as the Supreme Court might say, a pull of orthodoxy that comes with being too too strident on, on certain events? I mean, I think we can all agree that people should be treated equally and that unarmed black men and women should not be killed in the streets by the police. But on the question of, you know, Glenn posited that um, uh, you know, what, there are a lot of open questions as to regards as, as a level of crime or a, to affirmative action questions that now are seem to be uh, beyond the pale, he argues. So what is, what is your thought about that? You know, I think it's tricky you know, there are issues that have really pulled the university into the realm of public debate. For example, DACA, you know, the Mm -hmm. status of uh, young undocumented students who were given protected status during the Obama administration, which was then under the Trump administration, uh, subject to an effort to kind of pull it back and get many of them deported and deny them opportunities for education and work. And, you know, these are students at the universities who, uh, you know, the universities have a obligation toward them. And so many of the universities felt 
quite protective of their students. And that, you know, goes to sort of this combination of roles that the university is playing. And we see this, you know, now intensified with the pandemic. You know, is the university, it's, it's a forum for academic freedom for sure, but it's also sort of a home and in some ways in loco parentis vis-a-vis students for their time there. I mean, I, you know, just reading the article the other day about students who, you know, can't go home uh, to do their remote learning and the fact that, the, you know, they have nowhere to live. Uh, if they're on financial aid, the room and board would have been provided if they could be on campus. But when they can't, you know, they're kind of thrust into indigency. And what is the university's obligation as regards them? So I think there are, you know, a series of complex questions about the breadth of the role of the university. I think it's extremely important. You know, you, you know that all these institutions are feeling compelled to speak out, you know, and for good reason on issues of racial justice and police violence against black lives. And that, you know, it's a real signal moment to take a stand and articulate a position that puts you on the side of wanting to eradicate racism and face up to racial legacies within your own institution. And, you know, I think there's a lot in that that's positive and powerful. You know, I also think it can veer into censoriousness and that, you know, it's a really hard moment to, even raise questions about some aspects of that that I believe should be the subjects of legitimate debate, you know, whether it's what policy changes should be made on campus. Yeah, defunding the police, for you know, for example, is a policy, que- open policy question. Right, or radically overhauling curricula. Like that's something mm-hmm. that should be discussed. You shouldn't be afraid to point out, you know, how that might have unanticipated consequences or, you know, that certain courses that people may think are less valuable, you know, you believe, you know, uh, have great utility. And so I think the challenge of the university is, you know, is to walk the right balance between an articulation of principle and creating space for true viewpoint diversity and also being willing to stand up for individuals on campus who depart from the orthodoxy, because that's really how it gets tested. That's what everybody watches. If they're thinking about, you know, should I speak up? Do I dare defy the orthodoxy here? You know, they look to how the campus has responded, how leadership has responded. Have they had the backs of people who have done that? And if they haven't, you know, I think the impulse, you know, more often than not is just to keep silent because who wants to subject yourself to that kind of exposure, professional exposure, reputational exposure. And, you know, it's always a question of like, what is the universe of legitimate debate? And some people believe certain topics or viewpoints should be off limits. Others think they're, you know, squarely within the realm of what ought to be discussed and deliberated on. And we're not always going to agree on that. You know, my perspective as a free speech defender is that we ought to keep that territory as broad as possible and be really leery of shutting it down. And, you know, you bring up the Israeli-Palestinian debate. And I think that, you know, is a good illustration about how these arguments about, you know, that which makes me feel unsafe, you know, really end up being brought up on both sides. I think some of the feelings are quite genuine. And yet, if you accede to them, you're shutting down you know, all discussion and advocacy on potentially on both sides of that, you know, really important issue. I want to ask somewhat relatedly about apologies. You know, we're talking about, uh, we have been talking about cancel culture. A lot of the people who have quote unquote been canceled have issued, you know, apologies. You write that when speech offends more deeply, an apology can mean the difference between an uneasy encounter and a career or life altering conflict. I agree that apologies are important, but I wonder if they can also make things worse for some people. There was a study uh, from Richard Hania, I believe his name is, at Columbia University, is it, uh, I think the Peace Center over there. He found in a paper from last year, I believe, I'm quoting from the abstract here, that when a prominent figure apologizes for a controversial statement, individuals are either unaffected or become more likely to desire that the individual be punished. He he cites as an example uh, the Larry Summers uh, controversy at Harvard. And he said, when presented with two versions of the controversy surrounding Larry Summers and his comments about women scientists and engineers, liberals and females were more likely to say that he should have faced negative consequences for a statement when they were presented with his apology rather than when they were not presented with his apology. So, you know, what should we make of that phenomenon? Should we factor it into public 
Figures' decisions to apologize. In short, is there maybe something to Trump's reluctance to ever apologize? Yeah, it's interesting. Look, I haven't seen the study that you reference, but I think it's concerning if we, you know, are becoming a society in which to apologize is only to, you know, reaffirm everyone's perception of your guilt. I think that's a dangerous path. I mean, we do see instances of that kind of defiance, of course, from the president. I think other people have taken from his playbook, you know, I think of Brett Kavanaugh in the hearings, you know, just not brooking any of it, even when there was a very credible witness who was pretty convincing to a lot of people. So I don't say you should apologize disingenuously if you really believe Correct, yeah. your conduct and your speech was 100% defensible then you should contextualize it and explain it and i give some examples of people you know who've managed to do that and to you know really unpack why it is that they said what they did and you know how they had no nefarious intent and sometimes that can work but i think in general that you know a measure of kind of humility and humanity you know, in my observation, uh, you know, I think in most encounters, uh, you know, human encounters at the individual level, you know, can diffuse really, you know, fraught situations. So I would be, you know, I'd like to see that study, but I am not convinced that, you know, on balance, apologies tend only to make things worse. Yeah, I'll, I'll share the, the study with you after this. I think there are actually a couple that found uh, similar phenomenon. But I want to close up here asking um, about two different events that you were involved in. Uh, let's start with the uh, Charlie Hebdo situation. In 2015, of course, terrorists stormed the offices of Charlie Hebdo, which is a French satirical magazine. They killed 12 people and, live in, uh, and injured 11 others, allegedly because of its depictions of the Prophet Muhammad and its other attacks on religion and religious leaders. Um, the magazine went on publishing afterwards, of course, which I considered to be pretty courageous. I actually, in my office, have a copy of uh, the Je suis Charlie edition, the first edition that was released after those attacks. Um, you all also thought it was pretty courageous, or they were pretty courageous, and, and gave them your Freedom of Expression Courage Award that year. But there were some in your community who were opposed to your decision to do that. Can you kind of talk about how you navigated uh, people's, I guess, I wouldn't call it offense, but their their criticism of Charlie Hebdo and how you factored that into your decision to give them a Courage Award? Yeah, sure. I mean, to be honest, at the time when we made the decision to confer the award, it was sh shortly after the attacks. And, you know, it was such a horrific act of brutality in retaliation for the publication of a magazine that, you know, it seemed to us, you know, almost instinctive that we were going to recognize them. And we didn't give probably enough thought to the fact that some people would oppose the award. And we, you know, we went along and we were about 10 days out from the event where the award was to have been presented. And a group of writers active in Penn uh, sent us sort of a series of emails saying they were dropping out of the event in protest against the award because they believed that Charlie Hebdo was racist. Uh, and, you know, we sort of did a series of things. I mean, first of all, we, you know, immediately ordered to be rushed over to us, you know, the, the many thick volumes of all the issues of Charlie Hebdo so that we could kind of take a closer look at these cartoons and this coverage. And, you know, our, I think our sense was, and it was confirmed by the more intensive examination that Charlie Hebdo really skewered everybody. I mean, they went after the, you know, uh, Orthodox Jews and Catholic religious leadership, political leaders, and everybody was made fun of and mocked and sort of drawn in these, you know, highly stylized caricatures. And that included Muhammad, but was no mean, by no means limited to Muhammad. And, you know, there is this sort of French tradition of uh, laïcité uh, and the, the kind of staunch secularism and, you know, why it is that they have uh, such a, a pitched debate over for example, whether you could wear a headscarf, something that in this country would be really hard to imagine, dictating to women that you couldn't wear a religious headscarf. And, you know, yet there, 
you know, people believe, you know, you, oh, you can wear it in your own backyard, but, you know, you shouldn't be able to wear it in a post office or a courtroom. And so, you know, there are some differences of view, and I think there are some blind spots and kind of lapses in sensitivity, but we really felt on balance. This was a satirical magazine that, as we put at the time, was sort of patrolling the outer boundaries of free expression and satire, and that their willingness to do so under grave threat to their lives was an act of courage that we wanted to recognize. And when people attacked that, you know, our response was really to just try to defend it on its merits and kind of make the case of how we interpreted the work of Charlie Hebdo, why we thought the award was justified, that we did understand the concerns that were being raised. We didn't think they should be dismissed out of hand. We weren't outraged that people came after the decision. We respected the people that uh, raised the issues. We cared about them. We viewed them as valued members of the Penn community. And, you know, I sort of think in retrospect, it was it was kind of before maybe Twitter had taken over our lives to the extent <laughs> that it has today, yeah. that, it, you know, it was a pretty reasoned discussion. I mean, it got heated. There were some nasty things said uh, by a few individuals, but there was also a lot of, uh, you know, really thoughtful argumentation on all sides of the decision. And, you know, when it came time to present the award, it was sort of funny, but this, uh, the head of the leading French anti-racism organization actually flew to New York on his own dime and insisted on getting up at the podium to defend the decision to give them the award. Like he was so passionate about it. And, you know, that for us was reassuring, you know, that in, in in context, and, you know, and again, it goes back to this point of intent and context that's kind of seen in context, uh, you know, these cartoons, you know, were in fact not bigoted. And, you know, the other thing I talk about in the book is, uh, you know, one of the most egregious cartoons is this image of a black woman uh, on a cover of Charlie Hebdo, uh, you know, wearing pearls, but being depicted as a gorilla. And it seems like the most offensive thing you could ever imagine. You know, it's like the uh, extremely racially offensive, uh, you know, kind of archetypally so. And it's it's horrifying to see, uh, you know, certainly from an American eye. But, you know, it turned out that the woman who was depicted in that picture was French justice, then justice minister, Christian Taubira, and she actually gave the eulogy at the funeral of the cartoonist who had drawn that image and was then murdered because she recognized that it was sending up the French right wing and that there were a series of uh, indications in the drawing, including the logo of the right wing party that made clear that he was ridiculing them for their rampant racism and that, you know, he used the shocking image to do so. And so, it, you know, sort of meant a lot that, you know, she was the person depicted in that image or being uh, mocked. And yet she saw it, the satirical intent of it. So it, you know, to me really illustrated this point about intent and context. But, you know, I think there's another point too, which is you have to think about how your actions and decisions are going to come across to the full breadth of audiences. And I think we miss some of that. Well, I don't know that they had anticipated that their magazine would be brought to American audiences that wouldn't understand French satire either. Yeah, but you kind of have to in a globalized world. That's the thing. I mean, that's what's so hard. It's sort of, you know, can be very uh, daunting to think about speaking in this globalized world where anything you say or tweet may, you know, ricochet around the world and could be interpreted by anyone in a, a way that you might never have imagined. Yeah. Last question here. And relatedly, I mean, this wasn't your first foray into uh, concerns about uh, religious offensiveness. Uh, you were at the State Department in the years following the Danish Muhammad cartoon controversy. And at the beginning of your book, you talk about how every year after that controversy, uh, there was a UN resolution championed by what was then called the Organization of the Islamic Conference to prohibit so-called defamation of religion. Uh, every year, the United States deposed it for the reasons you might expect. Uh, but you were part of the team that finally was able to put that resolution to rest. Can you talk about that a little bit as kind of way of closing here? Sure. Um, I was working at the State Department. And as you say, every 
year or twice a year, in fact, once in New York and once in Geneva, we would do this pitched battle with the organization of the Islamic Conference to try to get their resolution on defamation of religion voted down because it was a resolution that advocated for prohibitions on defamatory speech. And, you know, in the U.S.'s view and that of our European allies and many others around the world, it uh, contravened international protections for free speech. But the battle to me seemed rather ridiculous. It was just sort of, it wasn't advancing the cause of free speech. I recognized that the Islamic delegations had some legitimate concerns about disrespect on the basis of religion being targeted and marginalized, and that the resolution wasn't doing anything to tackle those underlying concerns that they legitimately had. And so working with colleagues, we kind of hatched a different approach of doing a resolution that would uh, bore in on that underlying question of religious intolerance and bring together officials from around the world who are working to combat hate crimes uh, and hateful speech, doing public education programs, interreligious dialogue, and all the sorts of constructive things that you can do to foster religious tolerance. So we really made that the centerpiece of a new resolution and then worked methodically to build the support of delegations around the world for something that we could A, get agreement on, and B, that would be practical and constructive and actually do something to kind of get at the legitimate issues that were at the heart of the matter from our perspective. And, you know, believe it or not, it actually worked. I, I took a trip to Islamabad to try to explain you know, what was behind this approach. And, you know, I, I do find, you know, in all these battles that if you can kind of get with people face to face and have a dialogue, you know, not all the time, but a lot of the time there is potential for common ground, you know, even between the United States and Pakistan on the question of defamation of religions. Like, you know, ultimately we got to a solution that everybody was proud of. And so for me, that was in some ways the, the starting point for this book, which is the idea that, you know, these conflicts are not insoluble. They're not irreconcilable. It's not a matter of reviling one side or another, but try to look at, you know, what are the underlying concerns at work and how can we bring them together and accomplish a series of things at once. And so, you know, it, it takes 20 principles maybe to do so, but I think it is possible, to, you know, for us in particular to construct a more, racially equitable, fair, just world, but sustain the robust protections for free speech that we care so much about. Yeah. I mean, you, but with the example, with the religious example here, I mean, you're, we're again talking about subjective interpretations of expression, you know, with the Danish Muhammad cartoons, uh, Salman Rushdie's satanic verses, uh, you know, Charlie Hebdo's uh, magazine cover, you know, for me, religion is the first question, how we got here. Uh, it shouldn't be open it, it shouldn't be, uh, there shouldn't be critique that is prohibited uh, of, of those questions. And, you know, I don't, I, are, are you able to convince them, for example, that, you know, Salman Rushdie's satanic verses is in a form of a religious intolerance? I mean, how do you bridge that divide if, and, or, or the, the Muhammad cartoons? I mean, if that is the impetus for the resolution and the question pre presented before the UN is censorship, I mean, do you, do you just focus in on the acts, like hate crimes, for example, or things that systemically you might be able to address because they're they're codified in law? But the, the question of culture and, and critiquing religion, I, I just don't know how you bridge that divide, although it sounds yeah, like Yeah, I mean, I remember them, so, you know, in, when I was in Islamabad, they said, I mean, I'm Jewish, and, and, and I remember the my, my diplomatic counterpart saying, you know, we don't make offensive depictions of Moses. And, you know, he was sort of saying it very genuinely, like, you know, you should recognize, respect the fact that we don't do this. And, you know, I sort of, it, it was strange to me because it's like, well, I really would, you know, yeah. bother me if you did. Um, so I think there's some aspects of culture that, you know, you're probably not going to reconcile. I mean, it's how people are brought up. It's their religious faith. And, uh, you know, the, the, where you can find the common ground is sort of by saying, look, we may never agree on A, B, and C, but you know, what about D, E, F? Because we wonder if you know, we think these things would be beneficial, and you know, would it be valuable to you if the experts from the U.S. Justice Department told you about you know how we prosecute hate crimes, or you know, if we 
shared models of interreligious dialogue from different parts of the world that could be adapted elsewhere. If we brought leaders together, you know, to make joint statements against religious intolerance and put their moral authority behind those, you know, would that have some value to you? Is that an approach that you could subscribe to? And, you know, the subtext is very much like we're never going to agree on the other stuff. You know, we're going to be kind of fighting you tooth and nail on that if that's the path you want to stay on. But, you know, maybe there's a different path where, you know, we could build on, you know, the elements that, uh, you know, we all can support and do something tangible and practical that might actually change lives or improve the situation. So, I don't think the fact that there are certain intractables necessarily has to stand in the way of compromise and common ground. You know, sometimes you can put them aside. Sometimes you can prioritize other areas. Well, I think we have to leave it there. That's a, that's a good place to leave it as it's so much the theme of your book. Uh, thanks for coming on the show. And, and I hope we can, we can do this again. It's been two years since we did it last time and uh, hopefully not two years before we do it next time. Thank you so much, Nico. Great to talk with you. That was PEN America CEO Suzanne Nozzle. Her book is Dare to Speak, Defending Free Speech for All, and it is out on July 28th. She's also on Twitter at, at Suzanne Nozzle. That is S-U-Z-A-N-N-E-N-O-S-S-E-L. This podcast is hosted, produced, and recorded by me, Nico Perino, and edited by Aaron Reese. To learn more about So to Speak, you can follow us on Twitter at twitter.com slash free speech talk or like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash so to speak podcast. You can also email us feedback at so to speak at the fire.org. And we take reviews on Apple podcasts and Google play, wherever else you get your podcasts. They help us attract new listeners to the show. And until next time, thanks again for listening.